Thank you very much, and thank you all for coming today. It's great to be back at the Institute for Chinese Studies. I've visited here briefly in, I think it was 2014, when I was also going to the All India China Studies Conference um, a year. And um, it is, uh, as the rest was saying, I am um, completing now a project on uh, looking at urban history and urban politics, particularly, as you'll see in a moment, uh, from, the, from the, the, the perspective of, of the ways in which urban geographies uh, can help us understand certain patterns in uh, contentious politics, uh, politics of protests, politics of strikes, and so forth, uh, street marches in these two cities. Uh, so I will begin by um, noting that um, Um, you often hear Shanghai and I'll say Bombay today, with your permission, <laughs> because most most of my work is pre-1996. Uh, Shanghai and Bombay are often compared, often compared, but very casually compared. Uh, I was surprised when I started this project about uh, six years ago now uh, that um, I thought there would be a lot of work on on. The, these two direct comparative work on these two cities, but in fact there, there's very little. Uh, we have um, a few. There's an article by uh, a Chinese an urbanist Xue uh, Feiren and, and Lise Weinstein uh, who look at uh, some of the questions I uh, will be talking about later about relocation and resettlement and housing. It, but that they're looking at 21st century Shanghai and Mumbai. Um, but as I began this project, uh, I said, sure, they're, 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 yes, they're often casually compared. And this image from, these two images from the 1950s, uh, you know, you see the classic uh, Bund uh, uh, walkway uh, uh, here in the 1950s. Uh, and this, of course, is uh, Marine Drive, Chapati Beach uh, in Mumbai. Uh, you both see this uh, nice. <laughs> Uh, promenade uh, that the cities are both uh, famous for. Um, often when I talk about this project, and especially when I began it, discussing it with uh, Americans, especially discussing it with uh, Chinese colleagues and friends, uh, they would, uh, the Chinese uh, colleagues and friends, generally regard this as incomparable, uh, regard Shanghai and Mumbai as not comparable. Um, they would say things like, well, uh, look at our infrastructure here in Shanghai. Uh, Mumbai is, is way behind in terms of infrastructure. We have the world's largest metro system now. 
Mumbai's is, is coming along slowly, but to be polite about it. <laughs> um, we uh, in Shanghai, we don't have these things that, uh, that, that uh, are, are, are called slums. We don't have informal settlements in Shanghai. And that's not exactly true, as I'll, I'll point out in a minute, but that's the perception uh, that, uh, uh, and, and the thinking that goes into uh, uh, the ways that the Shanghai people in particular uh, think about, uh, about Mumbai. Um, of course, the other thing, uh, other contrast that, that would make the two places difficult to compare is the, the uh, political institutions, right? So um, you often hear the claim that in Shanghai, it's much easier to move people off land than it is in Mumbai um, because one of them's a democracy uh, and, and there are courts and there are NGOs that can uh, at least slow the process of relocation and resettlement, uh, and, and much less so in Shanghai, where there are no such opposition. Not to mention the fact that there are no opposition political parties or elections in, in China. So, uh, you know, acknowledging all of that, which I do, uh, I think it's maybe therefore all the more surprising that uh, as I began looking at the history of, of contentious politics in these two cities, that there are some interesting convergences. Now, in the book uh, that, uh, as Sura said, is coming out, I mean, it's coming out with Cambridge University Press, and it's coming out uh, in June or July of this year. Uh, and the uh, events that I cover in, in the book uh, show that there is a remarkable kind of convergence, uh, sometimes even the same year that these two, uh, the, the, the streets of these two cities erupt in protest uh, over, over sometimes similar issues, sometimes it's about housing, sometimes it's about, uh, sometimes it's a labor strike, sometimes it's a textile strike. So, uh, as I'll mention in a minute, both cities, of course, uh, owe their uh, early economic development in the 19th and early 20th century to the textile industry. They were global uh, centers of, of textile production and global, uh, global trade and global finance. So in Shanghai, you know, starting from 1919, uh, where the protests associated with the May 4th movement and more directly with the outcome of the Treaty of Versailles in, in, in the ending World War I, uh, whose centennial will celebrate, I suppose, or, or mark anyway, maybe not celebrate, uh, in April, May this year. May 30th movement, all of these events in Shanghai, of course, are the subject of, of books. Uh, but what I do is by placing them in a uh, narrative of the ways in which the city evolves, I link the ways in which the, 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 the city evolves, the political geographies of the city evolves, with the uh, patterns and claims in these protests. Uh, in, in Bombay, we have a, a similar lengthy set of, of protests going on in the 20th century. Again, not exactly the same thing, and of course not for the same reasons, uh, but uh, this is what I cover uh, in the book. And, and it's not, the book isn't one half Bombay, one half Shanghai. There, there's a, each chapter, I'll show you the table of contents in a minute, uh, tries to, to work back and forth across the two cities as I uh, do the discussion. Now, a little bit of uh, sort of literature and, and uh, you know, taking away the, the, the places, Shanghai, Bombay, China, India. Um, the, uh, some of you may know, uh, many, uh, may not, uh, many of you may not know about the literature on, on contentious politics, which is just huge. Uh, it, it, it goes from, and contentious politics can include anything from a, a small uh, sit-in to a revolution, uh, but and I won't go into all of the literature on that, but uh, there has been, in recent years, very uh, heightened interest in uh, the fact that uh, you see um, in the Arab Spring uh, protests, uh, this, this, you know, where do people go to launch a challenge to the regime? It's often in these civic squares or in uh, a few cases, uh, um, as I remember it, recall, recall from uh, the protests that, that took place in Turkey, uh, areas of, of in which the city uh, planners are trying to uh, do a redevelopment project, and, and the protesters occupy that space. So, 
Many uh, studies in, in recent years are asking these questions about how is it that these civic spaces uh, in various cities uh, uh, influence the kinds of protests we see, both the timing and, of course, the location. Uh, Asef Bayat, who, uh, whose two books I uh, mentioned there, uh, is a specialist on Iran and the Middle East, and I think he, uh, his work on street politics, that even though, you know, surprisingly, social networks can be weak, strangers can suddenly coalesce because they're all, uh, they all sort of know each other in a sense, they're, they're not, they're strangers, but they do the same thing. They're all hawkers on a particular street, and, and even lacking much coordination, lacking much uh, NGO support, or uh, lacking social networks, they can, they can uh, and have, surprisingly, uh, mobilized and, and made protest claims uh, at, at different times. Um, what this literature on contentious politics as spatial politics is lacking, I think, is historical some historical context that would, uh, you know, I think, sharpen and, and help understand where it is that these civic spaces come from, how do they become civic spaces in the first place, and how do they change over time, and how does protest, how does contentious politics uh, change over time? Uh, the one of the central concepts that I'm working with in the book is uh, that of it went, urban political geography, uh, which you know some people might prefer the term uh, urban ecology. I, I prefer political geography for reasons I can explain. Uh, but you can think of uh, UPG as socio-spatial forms, the tenement housing, uh, public spaces, civic squares. Uh, manufacturing, industrial districts, textile districts in the case of Shanghai and Mumbai, uh, migrant enclaves, informal settlements where uh, people who migrate to Shanghai and to Bombay uh, going you know, way back to the, to the late 19th or 20th century, where they stay, where they, they uh, auto-construct their housing. Um, the, uh, uh, these urban forms uh, tend to segment, segregate, or even segregate residents, uh, but they are also um, uh, produce identities and practices uh, by people you know, as they um, go about their daily routines, uh, go about their, uh, uh, their leisure, uh, go about their, go about their uh, political lives. Changes in uh, the political geographies of the two cities have influenced patterns in contentious politics and conceptions of citizenship. That is, in a nutshell, sort of what I'm trying to advance as a claim uh, in, in the book. <coughs> Urban citizenship, as opposed to national citizenship, is a, a subject that many urbanists have looked at. Uh, James Holston, whose work is on urban Brazil, um, he has a, a, a much, with a, a 1996 co-authored uh, article with Arjuna Potterai, where uh, one of them is talking about Sao Paulo, Holston, and then, uh, Arjuna Potterai is talking about Bombay. Uh, but it is um, urban citizenship uh, is essentially um, who uh, belong, who has membership in the city, uh, even when, of course, national citizenship is usually spelled out in, in legal constitutional terms. Urban citizenship isn't really spelled out. Directly, so it, it's one achieves membership in the city through uh, different kinds of means than one achieves citizenship uh, in the nation. You have your identity papers, your passport, your card, whatever that says yes, you are a citizen of China, you are a citizen of India. But what is it that gives you citizenship in Shanghai? What is it that gives you citizenship in Bombay? Um, nothing. You can't go to court and say, "Hey, I'm a citizen." Now, what can you do? You can go to somewhere, a court or a bureaucratic agency, and say, I have lived here for 15 years, therefore I'm entitled to subsidies, I'm entitled to certain benefits, housing, access to public services, that this person who arrived one year ago is not. So this is, this is uh, how urban citizenship gets kind of produced by these uh, back and forth between residents and the uh, urban officials who, who bestow citizenship by offering some of these social welfare, housing provisions. It's interesting, um, 
that you know the the Latin term civis, the citizen in English comes from the Latin term civis, which refers to a citizen you know of the Roman Empire, um, uh, and uh, the I think it, it, there, there's a, an interesting translation in Chinese for uh, and, and you know, many of you know Chinese here so. Uh, Gongmin is, is a is a literally a kind of a public person, but it's the word that, that's used in, in Chinese for citizenship. But there's another word that's often used, um, especially today when uh, uh, in the in the official you know Chinese uh, press, People's Daily and whatnot, uh, you often see the term Shirmi, which means uh, an urban. And Shir is a, is a, is a city, uh, Changshi. A Shirmi is is a it's it can translate as citizen, but it more directly refers to urban citizenship. Now, um, in my um, you know, and I, with apologies for not having learned Hindi at all, but uh, Nagarik uh, also refers to an urban. There's an urban kind of connotation there uh, for uh, citizenship. So I'm just pointing out these translations to note that um, urban citizen, urban belonging, is often connoted directly with uh, national with, with the term in English for the citizenship. Uh, so the questions that I look at in the in the, the work in the book are uh, how do, as I mentioned already, how do urban forms and spatial practices influence patterns of contentious politics? How do these forms and pat practices influence conceptions of citizenship? If you live in an informal shelter, a migrant, and you've been here in the city only ten years, uh, are you are you a second class citizen? Are you not at all a citizen? Um, and third. Interestingly, uh, especially if you, if you look at both of those long lists, Shanghai, Bombay, and the 20th century, um, why do we not have any you know, big events, uh, big, uh, large-scale kinds of protests? Of course, Mumbai has a protest practically every day, but I'm talking about the large-scale sorts uh, that we saw in the 20th century. What is it that explains the relative, relative quiescence by the end of the century, even when, even when we see inequalities of wealth, uh, and income rising very, very rapidly uh, in, in both cities. And we think that if, if we believe that increasing income inequality, increasing wealth inequality, and other inequalities will, will lead to social instability and, and unrest, then it you know, hasn't happened. Um, okay, this is a, a kind of figure that um, depicts graphically and this is not a, a, a systematic, statistically verified causal argument, but a, this is a qualitative kind of set of claims about changes in the urban political geography that I've gone over. Of course, there are older, recurring inequalities. These are these are producing each other. You know, rich people housing, poor people housing, uh, workplaces, same kind of thing. Some jobs are are off limits for certain kinds of people, and so forth that these produce, over time, uneven uh, new forms of uneven citizenship when you have changes in the political geography, changes in the forms of urban citizenship, and opportunities for claims for urban citizenship in contentious politics. The, the structure that I'm, uh, you know, to oversimplify a lot uh, is that there were three periods of major sometimes less so, a uh, transformation in urban political geography in Shanghai and Bombay. Uh, there, and, and the periods are noted there, uh, first two decades of the 20th century, uh, mid, mid 20th century, and then late 20th, early 21st century. Um, there is the, the, the type of, of identity uh, or, or types of I identities claimed by the protesters uh, in the three periods, and the traits of the uh, social movement uh, there. Or uh, really, actually, the traits of contentious politics is what I had originally meant to say. Um, so this is a, it's very hard to read, I'm sure, but this is the table of contents. And um, I go through uh, 1919. I, I talk, the first chapter discusses in detail what are these political geographies. I have a slide next to show you some of that. 1919, very uh, pivotal uh, moment in contentious politics in the two cities, both cities having very large-scale protests that year. Uh, then in the uh, 20s and 30s, uh, large-scale strikes. 
uh, in the, uh, and also lots of contestations over housing, but along with that, nationalist parties in both cities uh, beginning to take over. Chapter 4 looks at the post-1947-1949 period in terms of housing, urban planning, what to do about these, uh, these hut hutments or shanty towns in each city, labor repression in each city. Uh, 19, uh, chapter 5, I have a slide on this later too, the rebellions that began in 1966 for very different reasons, obviously, cultural revolution in Shanghai, rise of the ship seen in Bombay, but interesting kinds of um, claims about um, housing and jobs being excluded for certain groups in both cities. And then chapter 6, there's a, a freestanding chapter on Mumbai, late 20th, early 21st century, and chapter 7, same thing for Shanghai. So, in the rest of the talk today, what I'm going to do is, is give you just a, a brief kind of uh, synopsis or, or overview of some of the, the contents in, in some of these chapters, and particularly, because I know if, if you're not as excited about history as me, you're more interested in the late 20th, 21st, early 21st century, and so I've got a lot of, uh, a few slides on, uh, on relocation housing and deindustrialization in the, in the two cities. Um, so... Uh, going uh, back to uh, soon after the, 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 I won't say the founding, but the, the uh, introduction of, of in, in industry and capitalist relations and the introduction of these two cities into the British-led global political economy of the late 19th, early 20th century, um, if you look closely at the... Um, <coughs> Oh, this is a recording. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, hi. Um, uh, this is uh, the way that first chapter is organized around uh, the traits of urban political geography being sovereignty. Shanghai, of course, has these uh, the international settlement, the French concession, and the Chinese administered section. So, by having three different governments in effect, it has all sorts of interesting um, consequences for what. Uh, protesters can do. They can run over to the British-led multinational international settlement if they're trying to escape Chinese authorities, vice versa. If they're trying to escape the Shanghai, British Shanghai Municipal Police, they can run into the Chinese uh, territory. The very famous uni uh, Shanghai University, a uh, very um, left-wing oriented, many communists there in the 1920s, um, it literally moved its campus from the international settlement uh, where it was being you know, persecuted by British authorities and into Chinese territory and uh, less, less, less persecuted, let's put it that way. Migration patterns, um, uh, traits uh, of, of what it looks like in, in both cities where native place association is quite important, um, although it becomes native place and, and caste and religion lead to neighborhood clustering in, in Bombay more so than in Shanghai. Civic spaces, there are hardly any uh, uh, open civic spaces, any, any plazas, any Maidan <laughs> that you see many of in uh, Bombay. Bombay also has this rich heritage of folk processions, street processions for whatever festival, whatever religious community is holding it. Shanghai much less so. Uh, they have to build, in fact, the, the, the civic leaders in China, uh, in Shanghai have to build a, a stadium, an open field where they can hold rallies, and that stadium becomes very important in the 1920s and 30s as the, the grounds at which the, the big protest rallies uh, would be launched. Residential spaces, really interesting to see how, you, you all I'm sure know about the Charles of, of Bombay, and many of you probably also know about the Lane, Lane Alley or Lilong housing uh, in Shanghai. Both of these come about at pretty much the same time as there's an impossible shortage of housing and migrants are coming to the city to work, many of them in the textile mills, and you get um, housing uh, growing up, coming up, uh, very densely packed tenement housing in both cities. Uh, and you also have migrants who cannot afford even to live in those tenement housing, and you have uh, pockets of 
informal settlements in both uh, both cities. The, in Chinese, the Honghuqiu, Honghuqiu, the shanty towns of Shanghai are something that most people in Shanghai totally have forgotten about. But if you ask someone of a certain age, they, they, they might even say, I grew up in a shanty town. Uh, and they really weren't torn down until about the 1980s. So they were around from, from the 1910s all the way to the 1980s. Straw shacks built, essentially peasants coming from the countryside and rebuilding the very same house style design that they, they were living in back in the villages. Um, consumption spaces. Uh, this is, uh, you know, both cities have an enormously large amount of Art Deco inspired by that design movement in, in 1920s and 1930s. Um, both of them, you know, Shanghai famous for Nanjing Road, uh, and I talk about it in the book, um, how nationalist leaders in both cities uh, are obsessed with um, calling for boycotts of foreign-made goods and the consumption of national goods. Uh, and even in, in Bombay, of course, you're if you're a good nationalist, you must wear the homespun, the kadi, right? Uh, Shanghai nationalists did not go back to some kind of Qing dynasty or Ming dynasty, <laughs> or I guess it would be Ming dynasty clothing style. Um, uh, but, but they did very strongly advocate for Chinese textile companies produced cloth rather than foreign produced cloth. Textile districts emerge in both cities, and um, um, it's what I'll, I'll get at, well, though I can say it now, um, that during the big strikes, 1919 and uh, 1925 in Shanghai, 1928 in Bombay, what you see, and I think it has to do something with the urban political geography traits, is that in Shanghai, textile workers especially, but other workers too, uh, merchants, especially small business merchants, and university students, are aligned very tightly, meaning that there are uh, several occasions on which they all go on strike at the same time. The students don't go to class, the university campuses are shut, the workers go on strike, they don't go to work obviously, and the merchants uh, close their shops. Uh, and, and so there is a um, triple strike, as it, it is sometimes called, where uh, this is, you know, they're, they're movements and their coordination is, is closely uh, aligned. In, in Bombay, um, I think because the textile workers, and later on being represented by unions, by, uh, by a communist union also, uh, are so powerful and so influential that they do not feel the need to align with the merchants in the nationalist movement. And the students and in, in the uh, university students in Bombay are uh, kind of missing in a big way relative to Shanghai. Many of them are you know, joining the Youth League of Congress and whatnot, or the Communist Party, but they're not um, forming active political associations as was the case in, in Shanghai. So that's those are what I cover in, in the first three chapters of the book, and then getting more closer to the present, just a, a quick slide on post-47-49. Even though both ruling parties come into power with a transformational vision. We're going to transform China, we're going to transform India, we're going to move our countries out of the battle base of imperialism, of capitalism. We're going to make a city, a socialist city, a city that is free of slums, a city that has decent jobs, a city that uh, is of the sort that we envision that is fair and equitable and, and you know, much better than what the British gave us and British capitalism gave us in the first half of the 20th century. But national leaders in Delhi and Beijing were looked at Shanghai and Bombay with some suspicion. There were uh, 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 efforts to redistribute national wealth, uh, to take industrial surpluses out of, especially in the case of China, which has a planned economy. Uh, Nehru has plans of his own, of course, too, but uh, the bottom line is that there's a great deal of, of scarcity in terms of private and public investment in the two cities uh, during the, the first couple of decades after independence and, and revolution and liberation. You still get, though, large uh, increases in population through migration. 
The textile sector remains the leading employer, but this chronic shortage of housing, uh, despite the best plans, the Modak Meyer plan in Bombay, uh, plans in Shanghai to, uh, to do things that will uh, address these shortages of housing and these shortages of jobs. Um, in fact, uh, not much is, is uh, able to happen at this time. I can go into more details if any of you are interested in this, this period, but uh, it ends, and this is what I talked about in Chapter 5, with, you know, of course, this is, you know who this is. This is Shiv Sina. This is, guess, uh, where are our Politburo specialists? Any guesses who this is? Um, Gang of Four, remember? Dang Chun Tiao. Dang Chun Tiao. I, I was struck by the fact that they seem to have the same clothing <laughs> and eye, eyeglass preferences, so maybe this was something in 1966. But, uh, you know, of course, they're, 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 this is its own entire story of how this happened in, in Bombay, and the Cultural Revolution, and the Cultural Revolution in Shanghai, you know, it's its own dynamic. But if you read closely the protests, the strikes, the claims in both cities, you will find that um, there are some really interesting, uh, you know, housing is, is, is there. Of course, the Shiv Sina is all about giving jobs to local Marathi population. Um, uh, and, and there are it's a great deal of, of disaffection with the RMSS, the, the union that has the monopoly over representation of textile workers. Um, in short, uh, that, yes, these are, you know, this is from the far left. This is maybe from the far right or nativist, whatever. They're ideologically quite, quite different, but uh, in, in both cases, you see the rank and file of people who were following his orders, and same here too, that their biggest grievances are jobs access and housing access. Now you might say, well, I thought Shanghai had all these state of enterprises and this work unit and this iron rice ball. Yes, it did, but that system excluded several hundreds of thousands of people who were relegated to part-time or temporary positions in these textile mills, so they were they were really treated as um, almost uh, not almost they were treated as second class citizens in terms of getting access to the socialist welfare provision in Shanghai, and they took this chance during the turmoil of the Cultural Revolution, late 1966 and early 1967, to uh, make claims for jobs and for, for housing. Okay, so again, anything you want to talk about? Uh, in the, these periods after for, during q and I'd be happy to do that. But let's talk about more recent decades now. Um, the third section of the book, and it's really these two chapters uh, that uh, noted in the table of contents uh, that conclude the book. Uh, redevelopment metropolis is, is a label I use. I'm not terribly committed to it. It's not, I'm not trying to say that there's a new ideology, but arguably you could say that um, there is a a, 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 an ideological almost commitment by the urban leaders and planners to uh, rapid rapid uh, development in, in each city. Um, the, the parallels come in with the fact that you have urbanization through the commodification of land and, and land rising, prices rising so rapidly. In 1995, six, seven, right up, it wasn't associated with the East Asian economic crisis, but let's say in the mid 1990s, Bombay had the highest land prices, had highest rent and property prices in the world. I was really surprised to see this. Uh, uh, you know, even it was higher than, than, than Shanghai, of course. Um, in both cities, there are these land regulations that accomplish this commodification, that liberalize, that free up uh, uh, land through various mechanisms for, um, it's not privatization per se, but it is uh, doing things with land that allow private capital to uh, achieve great profits by building upon this valuable land. But who is on the land? Who has to be, uh, what the, the obstacle to achieving great profits, uh, uh, private capital achieving great profits off of the land are those who are on the land, who have lived on the, uh, uh, in the chawls. This, you can't see this very well, I know, but this is a, a, an old chawl, and this is the sign for uh, what is supposed to be in Karel District, the best residential high-rise development in the world. 
one of the media park, and it's coming up here. Um, this is in Jabe District in, in, uh, in Shanghai. Uh, this is some old uh, lane alleyway housing being demolished, and you know, same thing in the background. A little bit different, of course, because the land in urban land in Shanghai is state owned. It's being leased to developers. Uh, and the government will clear the people, clear the buildings, and then the developer gets to build in this. This is a little bit different in the textile district, anyway. Um, there's a lot of vacant or, or unused industrial land uh, on the side of the mill compounds. And they were the colonial government, way back, leased it to the textile mills for a very cheap price. And uh, there are planning regulations that have to be eased so that uh, the mill companies can turn over or uh, sell this land to uh, sell this land to private uh, commercial real estate developers. Um, also parallel trajectories in the deindustrialization, the, the, vac the vacating of the uh, manufacturing jobs, especially in the textile sector that have been in the industry in both cities. Uh, in Shanghai, in just a few short years in the 1990s, you go from over half a million workers to a couple of hundred thousand. That number is basically zero now, today, and uh, this is still 18 years ago. Mumbai, uh, through a, a, a strike that begins in 19, fall, late 1981, extends all the way through 82. And, and, and even into 1983, and arguably some people say it never, it never finished, it's still on strike. Um, half a million workers, about the same number in Shanghai. Um, these people who were able to come back in, by 1983 are signing agreements with their employers to say, I promise I'll never go on strike again, uh, or I'll lose my job. I do. I won't even complain anymore. So the, the, um, the, the textile the deindustrialization goes with the, um, you know, drastic weakening in uh, the power of the political power of, of labor. I think uh, these are some pictures of the two uh, mill districts, and there are more than one mill district in each city, but this is uh, an overhead view of Corral, and there's a lot of vacant land in between these buildings and these development control regulations, which I can talk about later. Um, you know, the debate is over. Uh, uh, one third of this is supposed to be for uh, affordable housing, one third is supposed to be for public open space, and only one third is supposed to be for private development. But it's, it's, there's a lot of contestation over it's one third of what? Uh, is it one third of the total compound or one third of the uh, unbuilt space? In Shanghai, there's uh, in the Yangku district in eastern Shanghai, um, there is uh, a lot of worker housing. And it's very interesting. I've walked to this neighborhood a couple of times. Uh, this might be 1980s uh, apartments for workers. Here you would have 1970s apartment for workers. You go back one more lane, and it's 1960s apartments for workers, 1950s, 1940s, 1930s, and 1920s. And it's not labeled as such, but as you just walk, they keep getting more and more dilapidated. Uh, and, uh, and even the architectural style, if you know, uh, you can tell exactly from approximately what decade it was built. This land, for reasons I can also explain later, is more difficult to, to extract people and ship them off. And so instead, it, it, this was the home of the number 31 cotton mill, which I wrote about in my dissertation in the making of the industrial workplace. The number of 31 cotton mills over here, so the, the, the developers can more easily negotiate with the, the managers of the mill to repurpose the land than, than they can it household by household. So you have this thing today where this looks like you know Hong Kong over here, and this is all this dilapidated housing across the street. Um, so mass relocation, again, this is going back to my very first comment where people are not comparable. Uh, Shanghai moved out lots and lots of people. Mumbai, it's difficult because it's a democracy. In India, difficult to remove people, but in fact, um, I mean, maybe in absolute terms, nine million households over this period, and even more before this period. Um, people, and uh, this, at least in this Chinese state statistical, the Shanghai statistical 
accounting, they do have this precise number of households relocated every year, you can see. Now it's hardly, it's hardly any. But in, in Mumbai, there is no official number. Um, I was talking with a guy last week from an NGO who's trying to do some right information things to find out exactly you know, how many people were relocated. But you know, if, if you believe the people in the Kenman's estimate it's about 100,000 a year, then, then you're getting to <coughs> a million, uh, and, and so there's not much difference between the two cities in terms of relocation. Uh, I put the metro population totals. Um, you know, so, so back in the 1920s, when we're talking about strikes and protests and marches, one and a half, two million people in Mumbai, two and a half, three million people in Shanghai. So it's not as though the, the 100 square kilometer area of these cities is now 20 million people. Over the 50s, 60s, 70s, both cities expanded very uh, uh, in significant ways. Shanghai has nearly uh, five thousand, nearly six thousand square kilometers in its planning area, including rural, uh, formerly rural counties. Um, how again? If my argument is changes in urban political geography lead to changes in contentious politics, how does cha how does contentious politics look given all this deindustrialization and housing relocation? Um, there were a couple of nationalist protests in. Uh, 1999, 2005, some of you may remember those. Um, they were not, in the long run, any, of any consequence. Um, there was a pretty widely covered protest over a plan to build a maglev train through, right through the center of Shanghai. Uh, and residents who were going to be affected by that, that maglev train uh, protested in People's Square. Uh, and the government um, Canceled the project because of cost overruns, not because of political pressure, but of course it was political pressure. Um, and you know about nail households. I think if those of you look at urban China, remember headlines from ten years ago. Um, many of these residents who refused to move the construction sites going up around the house, but they still refuse to move, um, and will do so only if they get compensated at a proper, uh, what they think is the proper uh, acceptable. Level. So, you know, leaving aside the nationalist protests for a moment, forever, these these contentious politics in 21st century Shanghai are all about property values and uh, not in my back. Don't build infrastructure that I don't like, and don't build uh, chemical plants in my backyard. So, you know, protests reflecting the interests and many times the individual interests of residents. It's not about class, it's not about Maoism, it's not about nationalism, as it was in the 20th century. Mumbai, um, you know, NGOs, so many NGOs, uh, but I think my, my point here is that there, there are some, of course there are many NGOs that are powerful, uh, powerful in representing the interests of the poor and the victims of relocation. Uh, and, and making sure that if you're going to move this slum population, you have to do so according to law and policy. But there are also some very powerful NGOs uh, who are primarily middle class, and that they're, they're quite uh, interested in removing the slum settlements from Mumbai to, uh, to make it like Shanghai. And, uh, Professor Chatterhaj uh, has done work on this, um, on, on the vision that Mumbai uh, planners and others had for making Mumbai into Shanghai. Um, Hawker's protests, uh, again, about protecting the right to be on the street. Uh, mill workers uh, in 2011 and at other occasions uh, engaged in maybe taking a, uh, a term from Chinese political history, doing the long march from their, their districts in central uh, Bombay down to the south part of the island uh, to demand their rights to housing. This is, uh, again, uh, evidence that political geographies and housing is becoming the central organizing principle around which politics is organized. Um, politics of compensation is another way of putting what I'm getting at here. Uh, 
state-society relations are in some ways about how much are you going to pay me and when are you going to pay me. Um, and one question that remains to you know, leave open is, is in relocation politics, um, is this new or is this politics as usual? Uh, and now just quickly some uh, slides of resettlement communities that as I finished this book and when I was there last week, um, trying to better understand re politics of resettlement, rehabilitation, in the, uh, in the case of Mumbai, and even here in Delhi this week, I've been to uh, talk with a few scholars in the way, and she has, um, but it's just an interesting, similar, parallel process going on in both cities. Um, the main thing I just want to draw your attention to is uh, these uh, relocated communities uh, are getting, taking possession of of uh, a property that is rising rapidly in value, uh, you know, almost tenfold over ten years. Um, this is a textile worker uh, compound that, that they have their own uh, their own um, scheme by which they are uh, being given 25 square meter, or it's really I think it's 269 square feet, um, and you know it's, it's worth half a million rupees in 2011, now it's worth 5 million. What does this mean? It means that uh, they have a nice asset uh, to uh, hold on to, to uh, for their family members to, to inherit or for, or for them to cash out and sell. And many of them are cashing out and, and in a sense voluntarily evicting themselves from the city with, with, with 5 million rupees uh, to, to show for it. And, and yeah, we could have debates over rights to the city and urban citizenship and, and whether you know this is this is a positive development for the poor or it's a negative development for the poor right we, we, we have a city that is being the poor are being kicked out but they're kind of kicking themselves out by by taking money with them and moving to the far periphery in shanghai of course in the typical uh, style of the chinese government you know building these massive communities a hundred thousand um, Urban er, inner urban residents and textile workers being housed in these 32-story towers. This is just one community, it's the biggest one in Shanghai, 100,000 people uh, in, in the part of Pudong, not so far from the metro, and, and also just uh, an incredible rise in the property values. And again, same thing, people there are, are uh, going to be selling out and, and moving you know, back to wherever or farther uh, out, of, out of Shanghai. Uh, and selling it to buyers. Uh, urban villages, uh, I'll get to those in just a, a very, uh, I guess I'll, urban villages we can talk about later too, but these are informal settlements that still exist in Shanghai, and many of uh, the people who live there who are recent migrants are servicing and working for as guards or as custodians, cleaners of the, the relocation housing compound. Uh, many people in Shanghai are awaiting relocation. It, it's, uh, yes, there are many who have attachments and nostalgia and don't want to be relocated, but there are many more people who are living. This is that same neighborhood I showed you with the 30s, 40s, 50s housing, this is the 1930s housing. These people uh, really want to, at least I didn't do a scientific survey, but with many people we talk to say, I, I want, I'm waiting my turn to move to, to one of these. Uh, and so, in conclusion, I'm trying to promote the field of Sino-Indian studies with this work. Um, I think comparing the sub-national and the two cities is an easier job to do than doing two countries. Um, I am also hoping that for those who are in the field of you know, modern India or modern urban India studies, and the same thing in China, that these well-known events uh, familiar to them in each city can be put into a comparative light and can be put into the context of urban political geographies. And I say that contentious politics is also uh, a, a field of study that uh, could benefit from paying closer attention to, to urban forms, tenement housing, textile districts, the kinds of things that I have looked at and their role in uh, catalyzing protests. And I'm, I'm sorry that um, uh, I can't come this trip with a stack of books to 
sign for you and, and, and sell to you and give to you. But I can show you the cover uh, of the book, and this is what will come out. This is the Cultural Revolution. This is the Revolutionary Workers, Shanghai Workers, uh, Rebels, Revolutionary Rebels, and this is one of the um, this is the 2011 Long March by a union in uh, in Bay protesting for housing. Thank you very much, and I look forward to questions. Well, you know, I realized how privileged to be yeah, because Professor Mark Antia gave us a preview of the, the coming book and in more details, and I think in, uh, 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 there's much more than what I simply expected <coughs> the book of the contentious politics and uh, you are telling me quite a long story, very complex, and then by bringing elements that are not otherwise, you know, this book, such as the, the, how political policy, patterns of, uh, you know, precedent and the types of precedents and the connection to, uh, you know, the way politics is articulated from below. Uh, and also, at the same time, interestingly, to the end of this, not very simply, but that now, how both in Shanghai and in Bombay, uh, two places which are you know, very political for a long century, mm -hmm. became, um, it's not politically classy, uh, yes, but come to, right. uh, come to accept uh, the new economic rationality. Uh, I mean, in, in the Shanghai case, as you said, you know, the rising income and uh, there's this, uh, there's a, uh, all, all the people are generally, seems to accept. But at the same time, uh, you know, I met a lot of people who are the simple about this, uh, you know, the and the <coughs> uh, Leelong houses, uh, even I like the Leelong houses, then I stayed for a month with an Airbnb. Yeah, in Changyue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Changyue, that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, and, and I don't, uh, but much better than the, the chores in, uh, you know, yeah. So uh, thank you very much for this wonderful lecture. We, uh, and also to for uh, you know, students and young scholars uh, and all of us to uh, you know how to think about uh, say um, you know special units and social actors and what happened to them in these two societies. This is a, this is a uh, you know rich presentation. We are looking forward to the July release and uh, getting our copy. Uh, which is it, uh, okay. okay, so we have a yeah, we will have an interesting show. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor, for a very nice talk. You see, I've never lived in Shanghai, but as far as Bombay is concerned, just just a small observation on Bombay these days. You see, to be honest with you, I've uh, hardly ever lived in Bombay, but whenever I chat with those who live in Bombay these days on the phone or like read what they're writing on websites, uh, you see, Bombay the, uh, these days, you see, either you have the local Marathi or even uh, Indians or not Marathis, but I've been living in Bombay for, let's say, the last, for the past 25 years. You see, India ha is ha showing uh, economic development but big time regional disparities. So these days, you know, whenever I chat with a person living in Bombay on the phone or read what they're writing on websites, they absolutely dislike the fact that uh, somebody coming from other parts of India, which is not that developed, like Eastern India, Southern India, they, this social friction is a big problem in Bombay these days. And frankly, uh, that this is just the this is what I just want to highlight. Yeah. We've already touched yeah. upon it during a talk. I just want to highlight this out. Thank, thank you so much. Yeah. Um, we, we, we connect a few questions okay. and then uh, so uh, what if we take some motivation to live in the city mm -hmm. and other things that economic factor like human development takes of both cities, in the, either in the Shanghai or in the Mumbai. And in which way, where in the suburban or in urban, or in the what type, what type of the citizenship, the citizenship they are holding, mm -hmm. what type of human development index is there, and how they, uh, what type of motivation is required for them to have a sustained life. So, how we should address this problem? This is my. I have an anecdote and two questions. Maybe. Okay. So, I lived in Bombay for three years. And my own definition of how do you, you know, when do you become a citizen of Bombay, I think is when you can navigate the local trains without thinking. Because there are no signs, there are too many people. But when you sort of learn to navigate, I think that's when usually people call themselves new bikers. Um, with regard to question, we also, a few of us also do India-China comparative studies. So could you tell us a little bit about the table of contents that you showed? 
So these are two very different cities, right? So how did you fix those points of comparison? You know, was it almost like forced comparison? Because this, this narrative flows so freely, I'm assuming that it wasn't as easy. So I mean, how did you fix those points of comparison? Yeah. And also if you could tell us a little bit about the methodology you used, you know? Okay. You don't speak Hindi, but like, or Marathi, I'm assuming. So like, how did you get information yeah. in Bombay? And, and you know, similarly, how, so was the field yeah. work, did they yeah. mirror each other? How did you pick geographies? And also, like um, he mentioned earlier, in Bombay there is a very strong um, sense of this Maratha identity. <coughs> Mumbaikas sort of refer to themselves as Mumbaikas first and then Indians next. So, is there a Shanghai? Is there a similar something that you experienced in Shanghai? Well? <coughs> thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, I, I think there. Um, no, oh jointly address the, your last point and, and the first question about these regional identities. Um, yeah, I think uh, the ways that, that people who regard themselves as, as genuine Shanghaiers or Mumbaiers uh, look down upon recent migrants uh, to the city, their whatever practices, both ways, customs, religion, diet. Um, this is, this is uh, a almost recurring theme uh, in the history of citizenship in the two cities. That you can go to 1890 or 1905 and find uh, very similar kinds of uh, <coughs> discrimination practices and, and, and things like that. And uh, Shanghai people are regarded by the rest of uh, the rest of China, other Chinese, as being <coughs> way too proud of themselves and way too uh, there's also sort of this crafty, too good at business kind of uh, um, same thing, thing in, 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 um, you know, hustling all the time, right? Um, and so, uh, I mean, the, the, this uh, the, the, in first half of 20th century Shanghai, there was a much more acute regional disparity of a sort that I, that I think has been constant. Throughout, throughout Bombay. Um, that is to say that people who moved to Shanghai in the first half of the 20th century who came from these very, very poor villages in northern Jiangsu province that moved down, they had a different dialect, <coughs> different, different practices and so forth. Uh, they were only allowed to have jobs as coolies, night soil collectors, you know, working in some of the illegal, the organized crime trades or in uh, not leaving the organized crime networks, but, but doing the dirty work, um, prostitution, uh, these were, and, and, and textile uh, mills, the, 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 the Sube people, some of you may know, uh, who populated so much, and women largely, who populated so much of the, the Shanghai. Textile mills were not regarded as, as real citizens, except during particular moments of political mobilization. Um, the, I, I think, um, an HDI, uh, which is you know most commonly done at the country level, sometimes done at the, the state or provincial level, um, and, and maybe you, you guys can tell me if there are HDI uh, measurements for at the city level. But I think even if there are, uh, they probably don't capture some of the most important things that help us understand citizenship and help us understand some of the debates over housing and work. That um, it's not just. You know what your unemployment level is, and and, and you know, the measurements of income inequality, or the percentage of manufacturing jobs. It's it's um, it's also, and it's not just how many square feet or meters or yards do you have to, to live in. It's it's how far you have to travel to work, um, what kinds of constraints you face uh, in daily getting around the city. Um, what kinds of deprivations are associated with living in what kinds of areas? So this is just as important in the human de development index question uh, for new cities or any others. Um, and then, how did I pick the points of comparison and what about methods? Um, the, uh, I guess I started out by having this broad idea of looking at land and labor, uh, these two commodities, you know, you know, fictitious commodities, in the, in the, the words of Carl Polanyi, um, and the Great Transformation, and I was going to talk about you know, land prices here and there, and, uh, over history, over time, and it became <coughs> clear to me that it was 
Not exactly. What I was more interested in was the politics rather than the prices. And, and so once I started reading uh, about these uh, events of large-scale contentious politics, I started thinking, okay, so why, going deeper into each one besides just what happened on this day, let's look at what the claims were and were they associated with uh, urban politics kinds of questions. And so that, that really kind of, the, the light bulb went off uh, two or three years, I would say two years in, into the project um, of collecting these things. And yes, uh, when, you know, this is sort of like the, compar the tradition of comparative historical sociology, or comparative historical analysis. You know, you have these books uh, that were used to be, used to be widely read, maybe they still are, but, um, you know, Barrington Moore or Fata Scotchpole who are writing at the country, you know, comparing four or five countries, why some of them had revolutions, why some of them had evolved into democracies, why some of them evolved into fascism, <coughs> I, I, I'm, I'm also inspired by the work of Dorothy Sollinger, who's written a lot about you know, Chinese labor and migration, of course, but um, a book that she did, uh, I think now about 10 years ago, uh, looking at, at labor union politics in Mexico, France, and China. So this, this also gets into the conversation about can, can we, you know, I'm a China specialist, and that's who I am. I'm not pretending to be uh, yet an India specialist until I know the language uh, and that may not come ever. But but are we allowed to, as China specialists, do comparative work? And, and what do we learn about China when we do comparative work? And it doesn't have to be a book like this where you're, you're, you're doing you know, a book-length project. It could be an article on something you're interested in, if you're interested in foreign direct investment, and then in the, the, the last third of the article, you kind of go into a comparative mode and say, well, how does this look in, um, in, how does FBI look in India? And that way we can see, helps us see things that we think are maybe unique to China, but oh, if they're happening in India too, then we need to maybe adjust our thinking uh, about, uh, about why we think China gets so much FBI. Um, and then uh, on, on methods, so I, I collected, you know, of course, all the rich secondary literature on, on the two cities. And I then looked closely for patterns in the kind of sources that each of those were used. So I learned that the Bombay Chronicle is the go-to place for looking at some of these events in Bombay history. Uh, I learned that the Maharashtra State Archives, where I did go for uh, several visits, uh, and, and sat and collected material, particularly on the, the 1940s and 1950s. That's what they had. These were in English, uh, of course. Uh, I think that, that and I was reminded of this in conversation with a friend in Mumbai, uh, who, who you know, says, I read all the Marathi sources, and I come up with a really different argument than, than you know, Professor Tandavarkar, the, 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 the you know, leading light of Bombay labor politics history. Uh, that is to say that the middle neighborhoods were not as, um, what, imbued as positively and collectively and had so much solidarity as, as I think some people, some of the way some people read uh, his, his work. Um, and, you know, for, for the, the more recent period, some site visits with, with scholars. You know, I'm not going out and doing my own mapping. Uh, but I go, it's just that all the great social research institutes in these two cities who are looking at housing. So going around with uh, a scholar and learning about the policies, learning about the issues, the challenges, the reforms that need to be done, and, and hearing them talk to the, the, the Chinese residents or the, the, the Mumbai or the Indian, the residents of slums, the residents of relocation housing, that, that is really quite beneficial uh, for this particular uh, Yeah, before I even ask about the question, as you mentioned that the Indian Mm -hmm. Did you think through the Polanyi notions and they take your redevelopment to create as a creative or for say this converting society from a community? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. You don't see a double movement. Yeah, yeah. well, yeah, I mean, the, 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 yeah. the other half of the double movement may be the, you know, the compensation of the housing. For the, you take away the land and then you give. You're not taking the land. Mm -hmm. Should I say that? I'll talk to the double movement. Okay, I see. Yeah. 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 Uh, good afternoon, Mark. Ravi Bhutaningam. Great to see you again. Uh, thank you for a very fascinating presentation. Um, my question is on 
crime and gangs. If you think of Bombay, um, you know, one of the aspects that is very prominent is the existence of an underworld which is yes. quite <laughs> visible and quite present. Um, and it, it started in the early days with smuggling of uh, liquor, which was prohibited at one time, and, and so on. Uh, but essentially its growth uh, came about, as you point out, the context of land, uh, yes. changing the permissions and wheeling and dealing in, in land, becoming slum lords and so on. Um, but it seems to have a, it has kind of expanded beyond that and has a fairly heavy presence. And if you read a book called, uh, what is the name, Shantaram, Shantaram. Oh, yeah, Shantaram. It is a very expressive book about textile mills and all of that. Now, I don't know enough about Shanghai, but I was just wondering whether Shanghai has anything like this kind of a presence, whether was it there, is it there now, what sort of linkages with the party and so on and so forth. That that was something I was wondering about. Huh? Do, do, yes, sir? Yes, sir. So, so in the, yes. in the, the pre-1949 period, the Nationalist government, the Nationalist party that ruled Shanghai and some most of China from 1927 uh, to 1949 uh, was um, eroded considerably by the presence of these uh, organized crime networks in Shanghai. And, and they were able to also get in uh, with the French, uh, the French concession authorities would let them run the, the opium trades uh, and, and other, other organized crime activity uh, out of Shanghai. So it was, it was a very, uh, the, the Green Gang, the Green Sakhal, had a very large, large presence in Shanghai before 1949. Now, um, in terms of the present, of course, no, there is no Green Gang, and there is no, um, I mean, there's some crime, but it's, it's uh, uh, nothing like contemporary uh, Bombay, contemporary Mumbai, as I've heard it described, too, that, although I will say just one kind of mm, analogy or parallel practice, which is that if a district government in Shanghai wants to make sure that these residents of this block comply with the request to, to move in one month and take this price, they can hire uh, muscle <laughs> uh, goons to, and, and, and this was really, it's less, much less common now, but it was quite common in the 90s and early 2000s for uh, these uh, squads of goons to come through um, and to intimidate the residents into um, to complying and selling. And then when worse comes to worse, you, you can physically assault and physically demolish uh, whatever structure they're trying to defend. Uh, any connection between the JRs of uh, Hong Kong and uh, Shanghai, the, especially the smuggling market? Um, you know, again, maybe someday we'll, we'll, we'll realize what we were missing because we weren't, we were, you know, the, the information was so tightly guarded we couldn't see the Shanghai police reports, of course. But there was a little bit of, of, of uh, discussion in the 90s about the, the triads. And of course, this is before, this is when Hong Kong was still a colony, uh, about some of the, the, them, they are getting into business in some Chinese cities, especially <coughs> the in the Pearl River Delta. I didn't see much uh, about that in Illinois and Shanghai. Many of the Shanghai textile capitalists moved to, uh, to Hong Kong in 1949 and 1950, and some of the, um, the Green Gang also moved there. But that, the triads have kind of a long history. Yes, uh, Professor Fraser, I just I was wondering that this uh, uh, one thrust of your one focus of your study is change of contentious politics, mm -hmm. and uh, of course there is a methodology and as you are, as you already uh, said that uh, how we were dealing with methodological this comparative uh, for this comparative study, but uh, this contentious politics in these two countries is. Uh, are qualitatively different. So, how, do you think 
did you uh, define it or some kind of definition is there in your um, thesis? Yeah. Um, okay. I that, no, that's a good. That's a good question, and I, I don't. I wouldn't say that they're well. It, contentious politics, especially the, the, the so-called transgressive pattern, non-institutional, you know, not voting and not you know, uh, petitioning and going to court, but this this sort of uh, it, transgressive contentious politics um, can be defined whenever. Uh, Someone or a group of people, usually a group of people, make a claim against someone in authority, in public authority, uh, to demand that they do something, and that they use tactics that are, uh, <coughs> generally speaking, um, questionable legality, uh, uh, not getting you know approvals, and so forth, uh, and some people would say innovative in their their tactics. So uh, some of these, many of these, on that list fit the definition uh, of what I just uh, what I just laid out. Now, of course, they're coming from, you know, they're drawing upon different kinds of repertoires. They're, and I, I think I show where these repertoires, these you know, practices of protest, uh, are uh, originate uh, in each city. Uh, and so, in that way, broadly defined, there, there are content that's it's, it's, it, fits the definition of contentious politics and not the definition of, of conventional politics where it's, it's more of the, um, the kind that the Chinese Communist Party wants you to follow and the, or, or the British in China wants you to follow, or the Nationalist Party in China wants you to follow, or the, you know, the government, colonial or post-colonial, they want you to follow. Hey, do you have a few more questions? One last question. Yeah, time is always a present. Yes. Now, the question we talk again. Uh, my question is with regard to the leadership politics of the CA Yes. And in Mumbai and such. But looking to Shanghai's you know, role in Chinese politics, yes. you say it's a very important uh, unit. As a political unit, you say that. Uh, there is, as you mentioned, already culture revolution, Chang Shu Chao. Before that, also we see formation of the Communist Party in Shanghai. Yes. And again, like you have this uh, 1927 massacre also yep. in Shanghai. And again, in culture revolution. And later on, again, in the reform period, you see Shanghai as a driver of Chinese yeah. uh, economy. So. And today, still, like we see at least what the, the party secretary from Shanghai being elevated to political standard mm -hmm. today. So, whereas in Mumbai's case, when we see it, uh, you don't have to be a technocrat to be a finance minister. But whereas, whereas, like, yeah. whereas in Shanghai, you have a uh, Shanghai person definitely holding a very important post in the political standing committee, but as well as other mm -hmm. very important policy making institutions that he or she he has. So how do you see uh, Shanghai in that realm and Mumbai uh, yeah. Yeah, doesn't figure Yeah, out. I mean, it's not, it's not um, I guess, directly central to what I'm trying to argue about urban political geographies and, and contention okay. politics, okay. But, but Jiang Zemin, mm -hmm. Jiang Zemin is, is centrally important in the transformation of, of Shanghai's urban political geography. You have a section in that chapter on Shanghai, of chapter 7, where I say the so-called Shanghai miracle is because if anybody gets, if your mayor or party secretary becomes the leader of the country, guess what your city's going to have? A lot of good things will happen uh, to your city. And I also um, note that, you know, how different Mumbai, Bombay's history could have looked had in 19... Late 1950s had had it become a city state or you know a union territory or something, not the capital of the state of Maharashtra, which took it down a very you know different administrative rank path and, and so on and so forth. So these uh, and Shanghai, of course, in the 50s was elevated to as provincial like a city. So the, the the different fates I think that they have today in terms of uh, the political power and their leadership and of uh, the gap between Shanghai infrastructure and Mumbai infrastructure. Some of that is, is because of the, the political 
the leadership and the administrative rank uh, that, that the, uh, a leader of the, of the city has. I mean, Indian cities, as I learned in this research, are, are you know, pretty very much unlike in terms of political power. Uh, it's the state governments that do this relocation, housing, and so forth. And the urban governments, the city governments, despite the 74th, is it 92nd? 74th. Uh, 74th Amendment in 1992. Uh, tries to decentralize the system. So, yeah, that is clearly a contrast, but I don't think it it, um, it is going to radically undermine the claim about geographies and connected politics. Uh, okay. Uh, sorry. Uh, sorry. Uh, there it is. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I uh, uh, want to just come on to that Bombay point, because I think after independence there was a proposal to completely yes. Uh, take Bombay out of Maharashtra and make it a completely autonomous city. Yes, that's and uh, yeah, and it had to be. I mean, the nativist politics had to uh, completely under the uh, Sena. They had to completely push the fact that Bombay has to remain within Maharashtra. So that dynamics was already on to play. And uh, from what I think, Beam was trying to uh, ask about why Bombay doesn't have. Uh, a political importance in Indian, I mean, it's uh, clearly obvious. I mean, I think then if you go to the regime type and how politics operates in both uh, countries. And I mean, for power in India, it's not the cities, but it's through the larger states, states of, uh, of, I mean, for all matter of purpose, it's uh, larger states in the north. So, I mean, that is at play. But I, uh, this I sort of wanted to bring in because uh, uh, the fact that. Bombay, there was a point of time in uh, in post-colonial India where Bombay was considered to be, or, or there was plan to get Bombay completely out of hands of the state government. Yeah, yeah. and I think yeah, as I was saying, is I think it would be uh, it could have had larger consequences than it was politically could have, depending on its relationship with the central government, it could have had been better positioned in terms of some of these late, later <coughs> development. Yeah, before I uh, ask uh, my, you know, the last question, I must thank you for showing us the photograph of uh, the young Bartakre and Chirapo. Uh, <laughs> and I'm wondering how did uh, Shantin Chirapo at such a young age, uh, you know, got uh, Mao's uh, teeth? And I think you are bringing lots of very interesting elements. In that article you mentioned how Lili San and Lili Bini was power. Yes. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a very interesting, uh, say, details uh, for uh, instance. So that's on you. Friday's talk. Yeah. You can hear. Uh, I, I unfortunately can't make it. Yeah. Uh, that's yeah, my question is uh, see, the contentious politics, as I understand from the old text, you know, Charles T. Lee, City yes. Battle, and uh, etc. Uh, are this. Um, I mean, of course, uh, you are right, you know, much of what you're saying will, will, will come in that definition. And you have used to say in the, and you have covered a different Aristotle period, uh, where you have said labor rights, um, political radicalism in China, etc., as uh, you know, sources of contentious politics, and you can say uh, large, uh, you know, collectives or social strata come together to confront them, uh, you know, state or uh, middle ownership yeah. or secretary, you know, all, all that. But, uh, but, but, but much later, when you use say, you know, the question is to what extent uh, citizenship claims can be a source of the uh, you know, contentious politics, in the sense that uh, citizenship is a, you know, sort of a, a claim to be, you know, a, a, you know, a, a, a desire, an aspiration, you know, to, 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 to be an heir. Not necessarily it, it, it's a, it's a right, a right claim, uh, but uh, you, when you oppose a big uh, project in your neighborhood, is it a citizenship? Uh, I see. Yeah, something I'm happy. Yeah. You can elaborate on that. Yeah. That's my question. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I think it's it's um, less. Uh, it's not. It's oftentimes yes. If it's a case of a, a residents who are opposing some infrastructure or chemical plant, mm -hmm. um, they are. They already feel that they're citizenship. That they are citizens. They're not. They're not um, among the group of, of excluded. They're not migrant workers, right? And so, um, uh, migrant workers had an interesting protest in, in 2017 in Shanghai that I, I talked about. But but if it's a group of Shanghai residents protesting the Maglev train, um, no, they're not demanding citizenship. But I think they're 
asserting uh, a desire as citizens. We are citizens of Shanghai. You can't build this maglev train. We are citizens of Shanghai. We should participate in decisions about what can and can't be built in our, our neighborhood. And um, the you know this this use of the term shuri uh, is very. Uh, it was used back in the 20s in Shanghai, and it's, it's being used <coughs> now to uh, buy Shanghai citizens, not in everyday conversation, but in more formal kinds of discussion and writing, that you, 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 these migrants, these three million migrant people in, in Shanghai, more than that, four or five million, uh, have to be shirmi hua. They have to be, they have to be citizenized. Um, and, and what is, you know, so I'm trying to get at the point that citizenship debates are still alive and well uh, in, in China. But I, I, you know, I do definitely accept the point that um, is it is it true that insiders, established citizens, can can do can do citizenship politics if they're already incumbent, if they're already possessing that uh, citizenship status? And I think I think uh, as I've said, and tried to answer your question, that I think that they do. They do. They make claims as we're citizens. You can't do this to the government, and then they make exclusionary citizenship claims for those who are not yet you know, urbanized. Yeah. Then uh, we all Thank agree you. that uh, you know it's been uh, such a wonderful uh, lecture. We all learned a lot from you about Shanghai and the Lian and the river. Thank you uh, very much for the uh, again for the. Uh, you know,